Good evening. Oh, this thing does work fantastic. Um, welcome to our Must See Monday. I am Mia Parrish. I'm the professor of um, Media Innovation and Leadership, the Sue Clark Johnson Chair. And I am joined today, I'm very excited to introduce um, Penny Abernathy, who is a former executive at the Wall Street Journal She um, and the New York Times, so be impressed. Um, she's the Knight Chair in Journalism and Digital Media Economics at the University of North Carolina. She is an expert in what we're going to be talking about tonight, which is the News Desert Challenge. She is a journalism professional with more than 30 years experience in the business as a reporter, editor, and senior media business executive, which is really important, and she specializes in preserving quality journalism and is very concerned, as am I, with what is going on in the economics behind the business and where we are seeing news deserts across the country. You should make sure that you stop and pick up her um, latest, which is the Expanding News Desert Report. I have one, and um, fascinating piece of reading. She is going to um, just talk a little bit for all of us about what she has found and the current state, and then we're going to have a conversation and some time for questions. So I hope you'll join me in welcoming Penny Abernathy. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, I've spent most of the day in classes, and so it's been wonderful to talk about this, and I want to spend a little bit more time just kind of giving a broad overview. I want you to stop for a minute and consider that we live in a media world of contradictions. Now, what do I mean by that? From your phone, from your TV set, from your laptop, we get an abundant diet of news and information. 24-7 stream of intimate videos of terrorist attacks, of celebrity shenanigans, and of course, let's not forget the opinion that we get on everything from the trivial and the important. But what's missing in that? What's usually missing in our diet is the kind of news that feeds our democracy, things that tell us where to go to vote, how to vote, who to vote for, or, or even who's running for city council, for school board, for congressional elections, what the policy stands are for them, and uh, how they voted, right? So it, we're kind of deprived of this kind of stuff that, that we need at the local level to make good decisions. At the same time, think about what's happened to the business models for media companies. So the digital age has encouraged new profitable business models for Amazon Netflix, but unfortunately it's demolished the business models for news organizations, right? So my research really uh, addresses these kind of dueling conflicts. So I'm going to stand up here for a minute because I've got some stats in here and because the, uh, I cannot see the slides here, so I want to make sure I, I uh, give you the facts and figures so we'll quickly go through this. So what I'm going to do today is address first the news challenge, and then I hope we can look at kind of the news opportunity for entrepreneurs going forward. So uh, in order to understand... Okay. In order to understand what's at stake, we first have to know what we're missing uh, and what we've lost. So I've done three reports. The la latest one, which was done in October, is there. And what I've done is track the loss and the diminishment of news outlets in local areas, usually small and mid-sized mid mid markets. So we'll talk about that. The other thing I've done over the last 10 years is we've got to have a way forward. So I've looked to see what's really working and what's not working and tried to come up with a way that we can think about this as an entrepreneurial opportunity, right? So my goal usually is, is not to say let's go back to the grand old days when newspapers were the prime uh, uh, way of, of getting news around. That's kind of like saying let's go back to the stagecoach days when we have spaceships, right? But in fact, what I'm trying to do is figure out ways that we can empower you as journalists to come up with whatever replaces the newspaper, the local newspaper, in print, digital, or broadcast form, right, going forward. Okay. 
So let's start by considering how unique and critical newspapers have been to our democracy. Okay, so remember back not too long ago, pundits were saying, who cares about the fate of newspapers? Right, they're dinosaurs anyway. All right, so why should we care? Well, let me give you one good reason. Newspapers are the, have been, and in many cases still are, the prime, if not the sole source, of the news that feeds this democracy at the grassroots level in small and mid-sized communities throughout this country. Okay, so think about how, what newspapers have meant for us in a democracy. They've been community builders and they've been educators. So think about the revolutionary times. Newspapers kind of gave a, uh, colonists a notion of what a nation would be and in, kind of educated our first uh, citizens as to what uh, rights we hold to be self-evident in a democracy. When we started advancing westward, one of the first things a town founder would usually do is also establish a newspaper because it would help bind people to the area where they are. So if you think about it, newspapers have been both community builders and educators. There's been a lot of research in universities that have shown newspapers do three critical things. One, they help us set the debate for in public important public policy issues. How do they do that? They do that three ways. It's the stories that they, they cover, it's how long they cover them, and it is the editorials that are usually written that show the way forward, right? They say, what happens if we don't do this? How, what, are, what are some of the ways we should do it? The second thing newspapers do is they encourage regional economic growth and development. How do they do that? They connect local businesses with consumers through the advertising and information that they put together. And then the third thing they do is they bring about social cohesion, right? So think about the pain of the opioid crisis. That's something that needs to be addressed at both the local level, the state level, and the national level. So newspapers really help us understand how we share things with people who may not be our direct neighbors, but in a county or two over. They show us how we're related to people that we may not know we're related to from all that. So the FCC, among others, has estimated that 85% of the news that is the lifeblood of our democracy actually comes from newspapers, right? And think about that for a moment. So why care about newspapers? Because newspapers have historically provided that sort of information and we wanna make sure that we continue to have that flow of information going forward. So let's consider, let's see. Let's consider what's happened to local news. So the report that's over there kind of tracks what's happened over the last decade and a half, since 2004. Uh, during that period, we went from 9,000, almost 9,000 newspapers to 7,100 newspapers. In other words, there, put another way, 1,800 communities that had newspapers in 2004 don't have one today, or one in five don't have a, a newspaper that had one then. You can see it is pretty uh, filled up with dots up there. Okay, of those 1,800, only 60 were dailies. The rest were weeklies, All right? So think about, again, how important a weekly is going for a community that's that small. Where have most of the weeklies been lost? They've been lost either in the metro areas or they've been lost in the rural areas going out there. So one of the things we did is think about what is, becomes a news desert. So I track not only places where we've lost, news uh, lost newspapers, but also and news outlets but also places where newspapers, where you only have one, right? Because if you only have one newspaper, you're at risk of becoming a news desert. So I define a news desert as a place where people have limited access to the sort of credible and comprehensive news and information that you need 
to improve the quality of your life, to just make good, wise decisions. Right, so think about it this way. There are 3,100 counties in the country. 200 have no news outlet whatsoever, no newspaper, no digital outlet. Another 1,450 have only one newspaper. Those, those are the yellow ones, the yellow counties. And another way to think about it is 2,000 of the 3,100 have no daily newspaper there. So if you're one of those that have only one now newspaper, think about it. It can be a county as small as 600 in Wyoming, I think, or as big as a county with a population of a million and a half outside Philadelphia. So how do you cover adequately the news when you're like, when uh, you have a county of, uh, of either vast size or a county that has many millions of people? Okay. Now, numerous entrepreneurs have tried to, in fact, 550 of them, have tried to set up digital outlets to cover local news. There's one problem with that. Guess where all the digital outlets are located? In metro areas. So when we talk about the flyover regions, if you happen to be in Kansas and you've lost a newspaper, you're out of luck, kind of, right? Newspapers are, are not there to provide you with the down-home information that you need. And then to make matters worse, many of the large dailies have become what we call ghost newspapers. They're shells of their former selves. And what's caused that? First off, the newspaper employment has dropped from 5,200, according to the one industry source, 52,000, according to one industry source in 2008, just a decade ago, it's down to 26,000. Today. Now, last year, employment in television newsrooms surpassed newspaper newsrooms. What's wrong with that? The t employment in television newsrooms has been relatively stable at 27,000 for the last decade, while newsrooms uh, uh, have fallen quite considerably. So what happens when you lose that number of journalists is you lose everything from Pulitzer Prize-winning reporters to editorial writers, to the person that covered uh, town council meetings, to the person who is the editorial cartoonist, to the editors of all stripes, whether it's a city editor or a copy editor or a news editor going forward. Here's one example. I took the Wichita Eagle where I used to work at one point in Kansas. If you look back to 20 years ago, the Wichita Eagle circulated in 73 counties in uh, Kansas. It had a circulation of between 120 to 130 on a daily basis, 1,000, and it employed about 150 journalists. Today, it circulates in only 10 counties. It has only 30 people in its newsroom. Uh, and it has, a it has a circulation of around 30,000 going forward. So there's been a lot of research that looks at what happens when you, um, when you lose uh, a, uh, a newsroom. So if you do not have someone who shows up to cover your, uh, your county town council meeting, uh, that is an open invitation as for everything from corruption to paying more for what you have uh, for your taxes going forward because uh, having someone at a routine town council meeting helps bring about transparency and helps okay the, the uh, FCC has been pretty helpful and they've said okay what do you and I need if we're going to be well-informed citizens uh, that what kind of information do we need? And I think this is a really good definition of the difference between what makes a newspaper and what the civic mission of a newspaper versus a newsletter, for instance. So the FCC came up with eight critical information needs that we need in order to make wise decisions in our democracy and includes everything from news about the health and environment uh, to uh, education to governments and to politics of what's going on. Now my colleagues at Duke looked at a hundred communities at all the outlets that, that produce news over a seven-day period in 2016 
uh, it, it was, I think, 16,000 stories produced. Radio station to a, a newspaper. Uh, and what they found is one in five of those communities had absolutely no local news during a seven day period. Uh, and less than 50% had anything that related to any of these, touched on a story even tangentially of any of these eight uh, going forward. So what's driving the loss is the economic stupid as um, James Carvel might have said, right? So we have a real, um, we've had the going forward and that has brought in a new type of media baron news organizations now many of our news organizations what we would call hedge funds or uh, private equity funds okay just to take a look this is the uh, example of what has happened between print and digital digital advertising for newspaper is at an all-time high. It long ago eclipsed print uh, advertising. Uh, news, uh, television advertising is held up a little bit better, but that's only because they get political advertising every other year in there. Uh, the other problem, to make matters worse, you can try to transition over to digital advertising, but digital advertising often pays pennies on the dollars. For legacy media, here's the other problem. Facebook and Google take 80% of the digital dollars out of small and mid-sized markets. So that leaves television, st digital startups, it leaves um, newspapers all fighting for that smaller piece of the pie. Uh, the, the bad situation has led to immense turnover of newspapers in this country. Uh, between 2004 and 2014, half of all the newspapers in the country changed hands and half of those changed hands sometimes two times or more. So think about how unstable that, that makes it. It also leads to round after round of, of, of uh, uh, layoffs going forward too. Uh, of the 50 largest newspapers in the country, they control half of all the newspapers, of the surviving newspapers. Uh, the, um, the largest newspaper chain in the country now is Gatehouse. It owns 451 newspapers in 36 states going forward. The, um, the other, another way to look at it is even more concentrated among the top 10. The top 10 own 50% of all the dailies that are still left in the country, and of the, uh, the top 10, five are owned by what I would call investment entities. In other words, private equity or hedge funds or pension funds. So the, the issue with those um, uh, financial institutions owning it is they don't bring the same sort of civic um, sense of mission that you would find in the past going forward. And unfortunately, because most of the uh, practices they've introduced that include aggressive cost cutting, it includes um, friendly uh, policies with advertisers, it includes declaring bankruptcy have been adopted by many of the other chains. Uh, we've lost a good number of the newspapers going forward. The South has lost the most, been the hardest hit with that. Two, two states in the South have uh, uh, counties of uh, 30 to 40 counties that are with totally without newspapers going forward. Looked at another way, uh, this looks at the top, uh, the, the 15 counties that have 50% or more of its counties uh, without a, uh, either without a newspaper or with only news, one newspaper, right, going forward, and 10 of those are also in the South. One of the things we've also discovered is that if you live in a news desert, your, your residents are much more likely to be older, poorer, and much less educated. And that has huge implications for our society going forward. Uh-oh. 
Okay, good. All right, so uh, I want to point out, if you go to usnewsdeserts.com, we have an interactive website with 260 maps that took forever to put together. You can uh, figure out what's going on in your state. You can look at who owns the newspapers in your state. You can look at where the news deserts are. You can look at, um, uh, let's see, there are a whole bunch of things that you can do. And we each one has a state page, so you can drill down to the county level to see exactly what's going on. Uh, this is Arizona. Arizona shares many characteristics with some states, and, and not, they're different, but it's a, it's a nice uh, thing, and it also builds off the uh, uh, report going forward. So before we think, all oh, abandon hope, all ye who enter here, let me just say, I've spent the last 10 years looking at news organizations that have survived. And what we know is that if you have a publisher and an owner who is both innovative and disciplined as an entrepreneur, there are, you, they will share three characteristics that enhance your ability to make it the transition going forward or to survive as a startup. One, they invest in their human capital. What is human capital? It's your journalism and it's your sales and marketing. Two, they understand there's not going to be one model that works for all news outlets. There, is go there are going to be many and that those models need to address the unique needs of your readers, viewers, and your, the residents in your community and your businesses. And three, they take the long-term view. They invest five years and they work backwards, right? They say, what do we need to do? Too often, news outlets respond to a drop in re revenue by immediately cutting into their human capital. They don't. There are still some things that are we need to address, and one of my concerns is trying to get uh, nonprofit and public funding to places like the uh, that are economically struggling because I think that's where we have the business model not working right now going forward. We also need to encourage much more creativity and innovation in the for-profit. I want to talk a little bit maybe when we're discussing of what I've seen because it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be totally digital. And then the third thing is that we need to, which I'm glad you uh, are focused on here at uh, ASU, we need to really think through what civic literacy and media literacy means. Because too often I see with digital startups aimed at especially serving economically struggling areas, people don't uh, uh, read about a school board election, right? If you, you're, or what, what's, what's important about who runs, if you're in Flint, Michigan, why you should care about those sorts of things. So what my goal in all of this is to say we have a news desert challenge, but I think there is a huge entrepreneurial opportunity for, for you going forward. And that's what we really want to do is first assess what is the challenge, but also what is the entrepreneurial opportunity going forward. So I guess we can, we can talk a little bit. So uh, join me in thanking Penny for giving us that great <laughs> overview <laughs> and for um, also for uh, kicking us off um, at a place of hope, because <laughs> it is it is a pretty daunting situation that we're dealing with, and so maybe we could start in that place and where you're seeing opportunities, where you're seeing um, hope in the desert of uh, right. business model. So I, I think that I want to start back to three things that the um, the publishers and owners that have I, I think been successful and made some headway. Uh, they have all uh, th first invested in human capital, right? So one of the things I've done on the new book is trying to figure out what is, what is your capital, right? We tend to think of capital as being the money that you have in the bank, right? And, but in fact, there's been a lot of research that shows that we have key assets we never think about. So when I go in and look, often working with a, an organization in a small community, one of the things I find that if they've been around for a while, they have an incredible degree of loyalty among both the businesses that are there and about the residences that are there. So people think that they are covering stuff, they're giving them the news and information that they need that's very, very relevant. So a key asset is often your, your ability to build community. And your ability to build community is to think about what your businesses and your 
uh, residents mean. So think about this. Advertisers follow uh, customers and customers follow technology, right? So you've got to think about a three a three pronged strategy if you're going to, to to succeed in this world. And the really sharp uh, publishers and uh, owners that I've worked with also just don't dismiss something because it happens to be old style and dull uh, and something that is not fun and fancy right now. So let me give you an example. One of the publishers in a county near where I live five years ago realized he needed to start diversifying his revenue. So he looked around and realized that the phone directories that were being produced in the county where he was was not very good. So he put out a phone directory. Now what's the skill set that you get from putting out a phone directory? You get a huge database. What can you do with the database? You can start your own search, right? Then he said, okay, there are places that don't have good lifestyle magazines. So he looked at cities outside of where he was. He started putting out lifestyle magazines. He thought, boy, if I'm doing profiles on these people, why don't I start doing video? So he starts doing video, starts thinking out, I'll start off from video to the advertisers too. Uh, uses that to set up a digital ad agency in-house. He then gets approached to buy a bookstore. Well, <laughs> the bookstore's losing money, but it's in a retirement area. What is there to do on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday in a retirement area? So he buys the bookstore, uh, decides he will start bringing in 175 to 200 best-selling authors throughout the year. It becomes quite a, an event in the town. Uh, he decides, well, I know retail. So he goes on and he sets up an e-commerce site. Uh, and from that starts handling art, uh, all of the arts and crafts of North Carolina, and then approaches the PBS station in North Carolina about putting out uh, an arts magazine, right? So it is a combination of thinking of the way customers want, how they're serving their needs, and thinking through how you make all of it tie back together in a real coherent strategy. Right. Yeah, you don't see a, a magic button. Yeah. It really does take that diversification of those right. model first. Yeah. And then continuously innovating right. and finding ways to, to do that. Are you seeing um, large scale companies that are doing this well? I think the biggest thing is have, finding companies that are willing to invest for five years. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we've gotten into a, at best, a three-year cycle. There's been a lot of research on um, companies that have gone through a similar disruption, and one of the lessons that comes from that is you need to transform both your cost and your revenue at a rate of about a third every five years. Right, so you've got to have a plan for doing that, and that that is the, that is true whether you're a startup or whether you are a uh, a legacy organization. So the key, I think, is not just to understanding where your key assets are, but it's taking a five-year approach out and saying, how do I work backwards? Uh, how do I prioritize where I need to be? I need to transform a third of my business and how I'm going to do it. The, the publisher I just talked about started out five years ago with 80% of his revenue coming from newspapers. He's now down at a third coming from newspapers, but he funnels all the profits from the other enterprises back into making good journalism. As he says, I see myself as a builder of community. And remember, social cohesion is so important Research has shown that it really leads to uh, political activism. People vote, people understand why it's so important mm -hmm. that you have to take a stake. Right. In, um, it, it, you have a stake in, in, in essence in what the, the quality of your life is in your community. Mm -hmm. So it's long been talked about that um, the job to be done for local news is community building. Right. right. I mean, that really is such a key component. And you've, you're seeing, I think technology has helped accelerate that division mm -hmm. um, within communities as you've had this decline in a news organization and the pressures that have been put on those local news operations. Are you seeing places where that is um, being really deliberately addressed or do you have thoughts on what that could look like when you have all of these you know, conflating, 
um, a confluence of events. Well, it, 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 let me let me see if I'm addressing this uh, that question. Uh, one of the things that happens when you have a very diminished news uh, outlet whether it's a digital outlet, whether it's a newspaper, is that you end up relying on Facebook for your news. So uh, I had someone come up from me, come up to me, who's a town council member in a town where I live, and asked me, how do you correct a story on Facebook? It turned out she and the mayor of the town had gotten into a disagreement at the previous town council meeting. There was no one there to cover the meeting. So the mayor decided to post his own account of what went on in the town council meeting, and for some reason she didn't think it was, was so um, impartial and accurately represented what she thought it was. So if you think about it, in many cases in small communities, that's just one example of what we do. Our daily fa Facebook feed is, I don't know, videos of cute kids and cats, shared vacation photos, um, um, I, I don't know what else you might say, except commentary, often ill-informed, <laughs> and uh, that just kind of raises your blood pressure. Doesn't inform you at all, or you want, you want to hit the, the unfriend button for some of the, the, the folks that are there. So you think about it as a news vacuum, and what technology has not done there, mm -hmm. I think, is provide us those eight critical information needs that we need to be well-informed. Mm -hmm. Uh, economists talk about something called rational ignorance, and that's when we say we don't feel like we have a stake in something. And so, to me, the role that journalism has is not that different than the role journalists have to, traditionally had, which is to make you understand why it's important that you know about this, why you should care about this. Mm -hmm. And the great thing is we have lots of tools and lots of ways to reach, lots of channels to reach people. You don't have to do it with the written word. You can do it in many different kinds of ways. But it's thinking, I think, strategically about how your, um, your intended user, whether it's a reader or a user or, or, or a viewer, is going to receive that information. So let me give you an example. I love reading newspapers on an iPad but I cannot stand to read books on an iPad. I prefer the notion, if I'm gonna read a book, it's just something that I comprehend more when I'm reading, but I love the ability of a newspaper, especially one that's totally digital. I find it, I can't imagine going back to reading print of choice. So do you read it like an electronic replica or? I, I, yeah, or right, I, I use. Or an app or? No, I use, I use it, I just read it on the iPad with the New York Times app or the Wall Street Journal app. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find, you know, the first thing that people worried about was when you transitioned, you would lose the serendipity of coming across articles. But I think we've learned enough now that I, I'm very comfortable with my news feed. I know where to go to find it. I'm, I'm just much more comfortable with it. And I find that my reading habits change. So in the past, on a print edition, I would be reading it on the train in the morning. And now I read throughout the day, right? You read it for different reasons. You, you tend to hit the videos. You tend to go to links that you wouldn't go to uh, before. It's just kind of a much more, yeah, much richer experience for me now than it was before. Whereas with a book, I want something with a book that I can that I can hold and, and read at leisure uh, going forward. More singular yeah. experience. Um, winding back a little bit, you were talking about the ownership and some of the models around right. that and what that could look like. I think that's particularly pertinent in what's going on in the last week right. in journalism, and maybe you could address that. So, you know, people say that um, uh, this is really horrible what has happened in the last 10 years when you have a bunch of financial vultures basically come in and start buying up newspapers. And the truth of the matter is, newspapers are not like widget factories, right? You cannot run them the same sort of way. But in fact, this has kind of been a progression. So in the 1960s and 1970s, a lot of the small uh, newspaper private companies decided to be publicly traded. Why did they do that? They wanted to raise money so they could go out and buy more newspapers. 
right, from all of that. So everybody started worrying, well, are you going to have a civic mission or are you going to be beholden to your shareholders? Well, the great thing is if you're publicly traded, there's a big transparency because you have to file annual reports. And so if I wanted to invest in really good journalism, I would buy New York Times stock and not care whether it had as great a return on the shareholder as perhaps a Gannett did. Well, in the 1990s, a lot of hedge funds looked around and said, boy, newspapers operate at a 20% margin. Where can you find something like that? They're monopolies. So they started moving in and buying up large shares of newspaper stock. So if you look by 2006, I think the majority of media companies, 75 to 80% were owned by hedge funds. Now, uh, some newspaper companies like the New York Times kept most of the voting stock in the hands of the family. Mm -hmm. But so most I others, right, just right, but, but one of the first uh, places this happened was the newspaper chain Knight Ritter, which was the second largest chain in the country, and they own Philadelphia and Miami and a whole range of other papers, including the Wichita paper. And a hedge fund decided to get to, together with two other hedge funds and basically do what we say, put them in play. Right, so put them in play is announced that they think they ought to search for strategic op opportunities, <laughs> which means sell them, right? And so you split them off, you get more money from all of that. So they put Knight Ritter in play. Knight Ritter ended up being bought by McClatchy, which then turned around and started the cycle. A second thing happened after 2008. If you bought a newspaper before 2008, you had to pay 13 times annual earnings or profit, right? So what does that mean? That means if you buy a newspaper, you're going to be in a community for at least 14 years and you've got to make a, uh, some kind of commitment, financial commitment. And that's if, assuming that multiple Right, exactly, that you continue to grow. Mm -hmm. Post-2008, newspapers have gone for three times earnings. What that means is you only have to own a newspaper for four years and you can come in, slash cost. Mm -hmm. Which you need to do at this point. Right, which you do, and turn around and flip it. And that's why so many newspapers have been bought and sold uh, since 2008. Many went into bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And then you've had, so you've had the rise of these hedge funds in private equity who went from owning stock to actually managing the newspapers. Mm -hmm. And so what you've had with um, Digital First, is put Gannett basically in play a couple of weeks ago by announcing that it needed to, it was going to make a hostile bid for Gannett. So the real question is, does how does that play out or have they actually put Gannett in, in play, which means they'll be forced into some kind of merger with someone else? Or, uh, or three. Yeah. <laughs> right. So what happens from that? So you get further consolidation in this industry, which is also not good because it takes you further and further away from your community. Mm -hmm. You know, as you, uh, many newspapers have gone to regional publishers, don't have publishers on staff, they have regional editors, and right? And so you not only have a newsroom that's been decimated, but you have uh, publishers, I mean, you don't have the, the, the contact with the community and the, the relationship with the community going forward. Local leadership, and what does that look like? So the Wichita slide was really, actually shocking to me and I was in Kansas City and right. not that long ago. You're seeing that play itself out and what do you see going forward in that well, kind of scenario? Well, I think that it, it, it's kind of interesting. You look at what's happening in Colorado mm -hmm. with the Denver Post, right? So the, the, we basically had a group of those reporters say, we've had enough. We're going to go to uh, found the Colorado Sun. One of the things I've been trying to do is work with foundations. And I thought what was really interesting was one of the foundations there said, we've got good journalism here. What these people do not have is a business model. So they paid for Bain & Company to come in and put together a five-year business model for the Colorado Sun. So the great thing about that is you can judge how well they're doing mm -hmm. in terms of reaching towards sustainability because they've come up with a business model and they can track their own uh, uh, progress going forward, right? It also helps the foundation, though. And the foundation made, a, I thought, a pretty good informed decision 
that, uh, you know, Denver can support. It has the economic base to support good journalism. Mm -hmm. And so why don't we, we help the journalists who form, the good journalists who form this, uh, kind of give them the skills they don't have mm -hmm. to go forward. So I think one of the things that we need to think about when we think about nonprofit funding is how you can best help. So, you know, I think, too often, the money that has gone, there was a study in Harvard that showed that 90% of the $6 billion that had been spent, uh, on, had been donated or, or given through philanthropy mm -hmm. to news sources, 90% of that had gone, 95% had gone to national or international news organizations, not to state and local ones. Mm -hmm. So how do you begin to, to pull together partnerships so that you're giving to organizations that are actually covering the opioid crisis from a regional as well as a local uh, standpoint and, and helping bring people together from all of that? Yeah, now, partnerships is a really interesting trend. You're seeing more and more media organizations that were competitive um, and certainly competitive for the, the the right. nonprofit and foundational support yeah. um, joining together. Where What does that look like, do you think? Well, there are several things, and I think it's easiest on the journalism side. Um, and But I think in each case, on a business side, you need to decide, am I going to compete or am I going to partner, right? That's a, it's kind of a notion. There are two classic examples that we're, we've uh, profiled recently that happened in North Carolina. One was an education, uh, statewide education website, digital only, that partnered with W. RAL, the the, radio, the TV station out of Raleigh, to look at um, a certain program that was been done. So they they produced a, a pretty extensive series on something that was giving teachers the ability to uh, to kind of chart their own curriculum if they were in a low performance school. Mm -hmm. uh, fascinating piece that included video, included a whole range of things that wouldn't have been done before, and putting the two reporters, the state house reporter for WRAL together with the education reporter made for a much richer thing that informed both teachers that read the education side as well as just general public about it. The other one that was interesting, we have a startup magazine, digital magazine called Scallywag uh, in the, uh, uh, the Durham area, and it partnered with uh, the, a small weekly down in Columbus County the Whiteville News Reporter to do an extensive piece on the opioid crisis because Columbus County has the worst opioid mm -hmm. crisis of any of the 100 counties uh, in the uh, uh, the state. Now, what was interesting was it was it included video, it included a whole range of things, but you got a first class magazine writer in looking at it from the the county level up. Mm -hmm. So the paper got an incredible writer that also put it in national context, right? Remember, a good news organization is going to show you how you're related to people you may not know you're related to. And the magazine picked up a ton of people who um, it might not have heard, have thought of, about in terms of, uh, of readers and ended up actually several um, hospitals ended up coming in and doing uh, pro bono work in the community to, to try to deal with that. So, I mean, it had a nice community building and a community value to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and Scallywag loved it because uh, they, it brought in people caring about something that they hadn't done before. Yeah, I think um, WRAL is a really great example. Um, Penny knows this, but not most people in the room necessarily. Um, it, that is a television station that's innovated for many, many years. And when I was in McClatchy, um, no, none of the newspapers, that was the only market in which the newspaper was not the dominant right. web site right. um, in Raleigh. And it's, um, it's very unusual for the television station to be the dominant web source. Yep. So they were very early adopters, and they invested in those three ways that you talked about. And so the partnership is really interesting. Um, maybe you could share a little bit more about what that looks like and how they've invested and what that's helped them. Yeah, and so, why, they're, why they're able to do that, which is right. Yeah, so so like I think one of the things that bothers me too is when you get 
um, these large chains. Mm -hmm. There, there used to be advantages to large chains. You know, it, when I worked at Knight Ritter, if Philadelphia wanted to do something, maybe somebody else didn't get uh, the, the money they wanted that year. But you kind of could spread out the risk from all of that. Unfortunately, with things contracting, uh, for everybody suffers, and you kind of don't get the, the ability to respond to a community. That's still family-owned, but right. right for the most part. Uh, but it has been incredibly innovative. It's interesting, the person who runs the digital operation, I've had her in several times and heard her talk, she says that she really doesn't care, uh, when she has people apply for WRAL, she doesn't want to see their broadcast clips. Mm -hmm. What she really wants to do is give them a writing test because what she's really, she's going back to the age of, the, of, of Cronkite, which is that you've got to be good writers and good storytellers, storytellers. Yep. from all of that. And so I think that's kind of at the heart of what has been successful, I think, about WRL. WRL understands what the, the local newscast does, but it understands that the digital is so much more important in both reaching new audiences. They've also done something that would probably have Jesse Helms, who used to own the station, mm -hmm. uh, rolling over in his grave, uh, but they have uh, brought back the editorials, but the editorials are on the digital side. They don't run on the other, uh, on the, the, the uh, run on the air, and they're very liberal. So I'm pretty sure Jesse is uh, <laughs> trying his best to, to change the, the, the uh, notion of where that goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've been, they're a really interesting case. We have about 15 minutes. Um, if you've got questions, um, do come to the microphone and you know you can line up and be asking those but questions nobody somebody will ask questions so in the meantime yeah, we got, yeah, there we got we go. some. okay there we go we'll get some questions and see what we've got going on <laughs> miss molly what have you got for us hello thanks Hi for there. coming um i just wanted to ask i guess um what is maybe one of the things that you're most excited about? So like in the face of all of these challenges, you mentioned a few, but is there one like standout thing that you think um, we should be excited for or where's the biggest opportunity? In terms of what it is for you or for what I've seen for, that excites me? For, I guess for journalism, like local journalism in general. I, I think you've got more tools than ever to reach people, more, more ways to understand what, how they consume news. Uh, and I think that what still excites me the most is what excited me when I went into this business to begin with. You have an incredible opportunity to, to be a part of the conversation that changes the trajectory of a community. I would encourage all of you to think, I've, I've had students who've gone out into work, to work with these outlets uh, across North Carolina and across the East Coast. And what they, they come back with are really, really impressed with how really strong news outlets really are connected to their, their community in a way they wouldn't be uh, otherwise. And so I would say that I wouldn't, when I came up, and probably you too, mm -hmm. the notion was you started at the, the largest news organization you could and you moved up all the way to the top until you got to your destination employer, right? I would say that one of the things I like about uh, my son, my youngest son, who's of your generation, is he doesn't see necessarily the same career trajectory I saw. He sees himself sampling a lot. And I would really, what excites me is when entrepreneurs like you want to go in and really not only save ones that have been good, mm -hmm. but also start, place, start in places where it's not. And I would say the other thing I also tell students is know what you know and know what you don't know. So part of running a business is understanding yourself and knowing what you're very good at uh, and what you're not. Mm -hmm. Trying to Thank you. With smart people. Yeah. Yep. And that's, I like the WRL um, example for that as well because they have done the thing, they've done things in the right way, they, innovated, invested in their people. Yeah. They tell good stories, they connect with the community, they partner. So when you do the right things, it still works, right? It does, it yeah. It actually works, yeah. Hi, my name is Tiffany Allington. I'm a freshman here at the Cronkite School. Yeah. I know one of the areas of the communities that are not as reached by newspapers is the older generation. Right. But on the other hand, a lot of the innovation 
comes with a digital media right. form. How do you see uh, newspapers serving the older generation while still innovating? Well, one of the things that's been interesting, students have gone in and we usually do research, right? We usually see who's reading what. So when we go in, we find that usually the person that reads only the print is going to be 60 or older, right? In some communities, it's older it's than that. Older than that, yeah. Yes. <laughs> if you're reading both, you tend to be in the 40 to 65 range, and then, but under 35, you tend to be you, right? And so it, one way to get them to think about it is lots of times re, um, editors have not wanted to put things on digital that's not also in print, thinking they were going to cannibalize and further hasten the death of the, the print. And it gets back to the notion of, you know, I think we assumed all of us would be digital by now. We're not. Think about the example I just gave of the publisher who thinks about bookstores, he thinks about mm -hmm. magazines. Uh, a magazine is also something I don't like to read on a uh, uh, on an iPad. I love the, the slick feel of a, a Vanity Fair or a Harvard Business Review that you can't get. So I think part of it is just kind of understanding how you can serve those people, what they really expect. So one of the things that I have done in the book is come up with a process where you can say, I have this much in the way of resources. I either have a lot of resources or I have a, a, a not very many. And then you match it with what your audience expectations are. So some audiences are very dynamic. They like to create news. They like to comment on news. They like to do the other. Others just like to receive it. And so it's making sure that you know where your most profitable customer segments are in business jargon, and you're meeting those expectations with the limited resources that you've got. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Other questions? Here no. we go. Hi, uh, my name is Anjali Shah. I'm a journalist, recent Phoenix transplant. Um, the, what you said about foundations funding national news organizations was so striking to me. And I, I'm hoping you can say a little bit more about that and the, sort of the impact on the way foundations work on our news ecosystem. Specifically, the question of impact. Like, how does yeah. the desire for blockbuster impact and bells and whistles, how does that affect local news? Um, uh, let me answer, I think there are two separate questions there. One has to do with foundations and how to foundations. One of the problems is that, um, and I think this is where we have to change the conversation. Mm -hmm. I think you tend to have foundations that support media or news, and they're very, not very many of them, because many of those foundations came out of news organizations, and as they suffer, you don't have the money uh, to, to invest or to, to dole out on a yearly basis. Uh, I think one of the interesting things is if we can turn the conversation around for community foundations to understand how important it is to have that civic role here uh, of the newspaper, how the newspaper has been critical to our democracy and how it's also critical to grassroots democracy going forward. So we can talk about them again, it's, the more we can talk about the importance of, of news organizations to communities, the more I think it opens up funding that may not have been there. The other problem with funding is it's been, it's been separated out. And so even five years ago, you would get a three-year grant and you're supposed to be, so what that means is almost immediately if you're doing a nonprofit startup, you're working 80 hours a day as a journalist, and then on the 81st, you've got to think about how am I going to get more money because the grant's going to run out in three years. So I think part of it is getting the foundations to start doing smart things like the foundation did in Colorado mm -hmm. to say, these are a bunch of really smart journalists, but they don't know a thing about the business they just founded. Mm -hmm. So why don't I bring in Bain mm -hmm. to help them think about how they need to be very strategic about, about doing this. And also part of it is to getting foundations, which I've been really pleased with. I've heard from a number of foundations who called and asked to use our database to target certain areas. So I've got one right now that wants to look at Appalachia, 
in, uh, and target some kind of uh, information there. I've got another that called that wants to look at uh, three or four areas out in the Midwest where you can start thinking about pulling things together. We've got one that wants to look at uh, one of the states in the south that's out in a rural area, how you can begin to kind of build a partnership with existing organizations, fund partnerships from all of that. Um, the other thing is what we, what we were saying, how do you kind of balance what the critical, having high impact, is that, are you asking for foundations or for, uh, uh, for? Mostly for foundations, I'm in the, in the receiving end of grants that the, the demands don't necessarily match what right. your audience wants. Yeah, yes, no, I, I think it's, um, uh, it depends on the foundation. Uh, I've, I've had several grants. Some of them are, are really uh, uh, pleasurable to fill out, <laughs> where you, they, they actually tell you these are the metrics we want to measure, so you can start measuring them from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I've got one right now that I'm really kind of struggling to figure out where the, the, the match is. I know we've had tremendous impact. With this, with this study, but it's, uh, it's very hard not knowing how the foundation is looking at things as to how to put it in the language that they might understand. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the more you can, you can be clear from the beginning, these are the metrics that you're going to be judging it by and that the metrics are realistic mm -hmm. going forward, I think it helps. There's a, a really nice example here, actually. I don't even know if you, do you know about the Arizona Community Foundation grant? No. Here? So um, about, it's now almost exactly three and a half years ago, the uh, Arizona Community Foundation, I sit on their board, so full disclosure, but they um, uh, came to the Arizona Republic and said, we are really concerned about child welfare and the issues around child welfare. It's a not sexy topic, mm -hmm. but a really important one. And at the time, the Ar Arizona had the worst rate of um, children in foster care. 19,000 mm -hmm. children in the state were in foster care, the worst per capita in the country and growing and you know had been covered and covered and covered, but not really um, approached. And they wanted to um, do a three-year grant to really spotlight that and to ensure that that um, coverage would happen. And over time, a variety of things have come out of that, and they don't have any say over what that looks like, but um, they have, some of the policies have changed. Today there are fewer than 14,000 children in foster mm -hmm. care, which is, I think, a direct result of actually shining a spotlight on that. And um, they have also had class action lawsuits filed mm -hmm. on behalf of foster children and um, foster parents because a light has been sh shown on that. And they um, just recently, did you all see the story about the million dollar grant? So a family in Mesa. Oh, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, saw the, a story that was written that would not have been written without this grant from the Community Foundation um, and decided they were going to donate a million dollars to an organization that helps um, foster parents, foster mm -hmm. families. So you see these impacts and you don't know exactly what's going to happen. What it also did was um, lead to another foundation in the community saying, huh, we really, we're really interested in the environment. You know, could we fund mm -hmm. a grant to help support environmental um, reporting. And I think so some of that is in how that got framed by the news organization and how the, um, they were able to talk about the impact mm -hmm. that they were giving and also the credit that they were giving to the foundation. And that was a really effective way for both of them to get the information. I, I think we need to be very indebted to the FCC for actually putting right. together what we actually need to know, what we need to know in order to make wise decisions, what we need to know about our personal life, about our, the, the political life that we do. Uh, one of the things that I was asked to do a couple of months ago, a couple of months ago was uh, Cyline, which was, which is designed to help general assignment reporters do environmental stories or science stories because they've been, invariably now you don't have science reporters, you have poor general assignment reporters who get handled a big story and they don't know where to go so they put together uh, experts with uh, the, uh, every, uh, with, uh, the uh, reporter to help enhance the reporting story. They asked the, first off to take a look at the news deserts uh, database to see how many stories they had actually produced out of the news deserts. 
uh, which is, it was kind of an interesting way to judge their own impact. And then the second thing they did is ask us to overlay the, the stories they had done in terms of how they addressed one of those critical information needs. So I think that, you know, there's lots of ways you can begin to think about impact that when you've got data like you've got now, of whether you're actually addressing uh, those needs. The other thing I would say, somebody, I love that question, what excites you? The other thing I would say is one of the things I worry the most is, the, is how we have seen the demolition of what we used to call the editorial writing function mm -hmm. of newspapers. That's again where WRAL has really taken a lead in putting Passing together the, the, the editorials when it's, been, when it's been obliterated in the state and they've taken on that. Um, and I, I would hope that we, that's so critically important of coming back and saying, here's what, here's what the facts said, mm -hmm. and here's what will happen if we don't do anything. Mm -hmm. Here's what, here's what we, having looked at the facts, here's what we recommend, because that editorial voice really moves things along. There's an excellent book that was written last year called Democracy's Detectives. It was written by Jay Hamilton, an economist that was trained at Harvard, who's now at Stanford. And he looked at all the investigative pieces that had won Pulitzer Prizes or IRE awards, and he put an actual price tag on how much it had saved society in our communities in terms of like the hog farm mm -hmm. Pulitzer, the Pulitzer Prize that was won by the News and Observer for exposing the environmental problems of hog farms mm -hmm. in eastern North Carolina which led to a moratorium on hog farms and he puts a price tag on what had, what had been saved you know what was averted by having those he looked at the, I think it was a needle exchange in Seattle, what that actually saved in terms of human life, on uh, things on road safety. So, you know, the, the, what excites me is that uh, there's, there's a n more need than ever in a glut of information to really focus on what's important and what's, what's a priority. So getting the skills to be able to tell a complex story mm -hmm. and put the context and the meaning around it, I think is what excites me about being a journalist. It excited me back when I decided to be a journalist, and it excites me today is the ability to really advance that conversation and advance our understanding. Right. Um, never been more important, and so um, really enjoyed having this conversation with you today. Thank you, me and too. enjoyed Thank you guys for coming, yeah. And um, if you join me in thanking Penny. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.